So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to first talk about English syllables. Um, and we'll talk about those in order to get to the Hebrew syllables. So these will be made available to you, both the English and the Hebrew lesson. But I'm just going to read a little bit of what I've prepared here. So um, in English, for English speakers, it is not something that is usually taught to children, because children usually start off by making sounds and generally do not need to be taught these concepts, which I'm about to tell you. Uh, students that are where English is their second language would learn this. Most English speakers would not. You would learn syllables and how to, how to determine English syllables. But for English as a second language, how a part of the speech would be conveyed. Let's do this on my tablet. So let's take the word bed and how that's just a monosyllabic there's no, it's just one syllable, bed. But to explain the parts inside of this one syllable, you would call the first letter the onset. The second letter would be called the nucleus. And the third would be called the coda. Now, I said English speakers generally don't learn that. Because as a child, like I said, a child will start with things like hmm, mama, or papa. And they, it's automatic. It's something that's it happens as speech develops. But this is important to learn this, these terminologies because they will be helpful to understand how Hebrew also has its parts of speech, uh, how to understand phonology, and there's a difference between phonology and phonetics, which we'll get to in another lesson. But I just want to give the introduction. Um, so I've given you the idea. Essentially, the first letter of a one-syllable word would be called onset, the second nucleus, the third coda. Um, in English, and I'll, I'll, we'll read and write at the same time here. So in English, there are six different types of syllables. Some of you are going, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. But it's going to be very rewarding because, you see, English has six different types of syllables. Hebrew only has two. It's like, wow, OK, that's good. So um, English has closed. And simply what closed is, a closed syllable is something that has one vowel and ends with a consonant. So. And you can download this, so it's going to be much better for you to read than it is as, I, as I'm trying to write it and explain it. But one vowel and a consonant, such as in or on, one vowel, one consonant, and one vowel and consonant ending. So that is considered closed, a closed syllable. One vowel ends in a consonant. Open, an open syllable, is a word that has one vowel, and that one vowel is at the end of the syllable. So for example, open, this is English. This is not a foreign language. So <laughs> open, he, the, be. So you can see that open. And this, these two concepts are perhaps the most important for us to remember when we come to learning our Hebrew tonight, because these are the two that the Hebrew uses, open and closed. The other four that are applicable in English are not applicable to Hebrew. I will cover them anyway for the sake of knowing what they are, so it might refresh some of our memories. Um, but really, the thing that is very simple, it's not a difficult lesson, uh, but retain this information. Closed both in English and in Hebrew will terminate in a consonant. And open will terminate with a vowel. And that's why it was important for you to do your vowel lessons and to at least recognize them so that you'll be able to understand 
syllabification. Say that 10 times. All right. So um, we have closed and open. These are the ones you need to know for Hebrew. But I'll give you, in fact, I'll just read you the rest, and you can, when you download it, you can, it's self explanatory. Three is a silent E syllable. So there are letters they are, that have an E. It ends with an E, has one consonant before that E, and one vowel before that consonant. So, for example, the words these, when I said it ends in E, there's a consonant and then there's a vowel. You can see the pattern, or thine. So it's vowel, consonant, vowel. And yes, this is English. And the word eight, A-T-E, vowel, consonant, vowel. So that is called the E class, not a car, vowels. <laughs> then you've got the combination syllables. Sometimes two or three vowels plus a consonant. For example, so we'll put this down as combo. All right? So, for example, the word the, consonant, vowel, vowel, C, consonant, vowel, vowel, true. You've got consonant, vowel, vowel. So we have here one and two. Open and close are the ones you need to know, but then number three, just for your information, the E class. Number four, the combo. Number five, the R, letter R, syllables. Those are one vowel followed by R and or one vowel followed by R followed by a silent E, like care. So you've got vowel, consonant, E, or even something like car, where you've got a vowel, sorry, a vowel and a consonant. That's E belongs to that over there. We'll put this here. E. All right. Num this would be number five. And one more. Number six. Consonant L-E syllables. Those are words that end in D-L-E, B-L-E, G-L-E. Words, for example, like candle, where you've got D L E. So in English, if you were trying to find out where the syllable split would be, you would look for where the word ends. All of these help to understand how syllables work within the English language. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was learning uh, English, mind you, probably not like you learned it, but when I was learning, I had people clap out the syllables for me. I don't know if anybody did that for you, but they'd clap out the sounds. You could hear if it was two syllables, broken, whatever they would, they would clap out the sound. So you could, but we have these wonderful tools. And as I said, you really only need the open and the close. But if you're, if you're trying to figure out, okay, I'd like to know what I'm supposed to do with a, let's get a new page. I'm trying to figure out what I should do with, um, finding and dividing syllables in English, because I told you you'd get a small English lesson. So you can always know how to divide an English syllable if you have words that have double consonants, like the word happen. You know, you would split right down between the two Ps, and that's where you would divide your syllable. Now, one may say, why are you doing this? Because we're English speakers. But when you get into learning Hebrew, understanding where the syllable breaks are important not only for uh, pronunciation, but also they will help with the lesson we're about to do tonight. We'll show you how important syllabification is in Hebrew. Um, so don't tune out. Um, there are exceptions to this type of splitting. We never, in English, we would never split th, we would never split ph, we would never split ch. So there's Words that are glued together, we never split them. Um, where you would split for a consonant in a single middle consonant, for example, E, split, evil. There's where you would split. So there are certain rules for splitting if someone's trying to find out what they are. The last and most, I think, 
The easiest one to detect is prefixes and suffixes in the English language. They're pretty simple to identify, like the word unpaid has a prefix, the prefix un, that's where you'd split the word. If you were trying to split it, it would be un, that is a prefix, unpaid. And that's where you would split the word to begin, to begin to identify the syllables within that word. So that is your very quick syllables in English. Now why does this become important for us to at least grasp the open and close in Hebrew? Because what happens in Hebrew, you'll notice when we did our alphabet, the whole alphabet is made up of consonants and then the vowels are added underneath. We just, I just showed you a vowel chart which looks like this. And in the Hebrew, you might say, well, how will I know? I know what, what a consonant looks like in English and I know what a consonant looks like in Hebrew, so how will I know where to split this? Because where Hebrew does something different from English, open and close is the same, open and close syllables, but what is different is the English speakers sp will stress or accent on the first syllable of a word. The Hebrew usually stresses on the last. So that's a very important shift, especially for those who are going to try and pronounce or read or use a lexical tool. The stress is always on the end. And you may remember that in some strange way. Now, if we were going to dissect a word, we'll get a new, brand new page, let's dissect a word. This is all on this handout. Let's take this word and uh, I'm, writing, I'm writing the word, word, except I'm not going to write, I'm not going to put a dot in the middle. I'm, I'll explain probably in another lesson. Uh, should be pronounced devar. I may say debar. In fact, on my handout, it reads both. I want you to see what's interesting about this Hebrew word. This, by the way, this word, devar, means word. Our word for word, that is the word for word in Hebrew. Wow. Okay, now let's get another color and let's split this thing. So I'm going to split this right here and I'm going to show you something really interesting. This part of this word happens to be open. Why? Because we have D and A. The syllable ends in an A. So this is the open part of this word. The emphasis is on the last part, which is either going to be read as bar or var. And this is what a closed syllable in Hebrew looks like. Why? Because it ends in a consonant. So that's how you're going to know between open and close. Remember, when you're reading your Hebrew, um, I do not think, there may be one exception, but by and large, the vowels are read after the letter. So it's not, this would not appear as ad, it, it appears as da, consonant first, then vowel. So a, ah, open, because it's a vowel, it is an open syllable. This ending as a consonant makes it closed. Now, here comes the interesting uh, terminology. If you are reading grammar books, this will drive you absolutely insane. That's why I said I'd love to recommend a book, but I, I seem to think that, because I think I have all of them, each one assumes that you, as a student, either understand the terminology they're using, or you're either so far advanced, even though it may be a beginner's book. So you'll often find those grammarians using the, uh, uh, you remember Dr. Scott used to talk about logodemic and practodemic, that language that is to a community, and then what is implemented to communicate. And I find that most of these books are never implemented to communicate to others. It's all within the community of, uh, we, we, we grammarians will converse with each other. We'll just write a book and you might be able to decipher it. So 
if you're reading a grammar book, they will use terms like, for Hebrew, accented or unaccented. Now, I want to make something clear. I have trouble with that terminology for a reason, because I read languages, read and write languages such as French, and French is a, hev a heavily accented language. And when you speak of accenting in French, you are using marks, um, accents to accent the words. So when, if you are following or trying to do lessons in other grammar books and you encounter accented or unaccented, that's okay for you as long as you understand what it really means. Syllables that are stressed, the emphasis is placed on. Um, so when I just pointed out, for example, that this is closed, this part of, of the syllable of this, uh, there are two syllables here, one and two. And I would say this one, the second one, the end one, is stressed. The emphasis of the word falls on the second syllable. So I, I'm perfectly fine with you referring to it accented or unaccented. Just make sure you understand what that means, that the stress is on this end part, which therefore, if you were using that language, would be accented. You can tell for me, having the broad spectrum of languages that I'm familiar with, it's very frustrating because I think, what if a person who was learning this language and who understood what accented meant in their language frame, it would be very confusing. So, stress, all right? Now, sometimes, and I don't have an example for you, but sometimes you'll find words that will have a little, I've put a little sign on top of, let's make up a hypothetical, uh, I don't know, we'll just, we'll, we'll call it, um, although I know that's not true, I just wrote bail, but uh, don't, this is not a real example, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. If you see this little diggity do there on top of a letter, that is the Hebrew way of telling you, stop and pay attention, the accent's not on the end. Wherever this, on top of whatever letter this falls is where the stress is going to be. Now, I need to redefine this for a minute. Typically, the stress, uh, the accent, is going to be on the last syllable. It's opposite of English. So English starts off with putting the most stress on the first syllable. The Hebrew does the reverse. The emphasis is on the last syllable. So if you understand what I'm saying, um, this marker here, if it appears somewhere early on in the word, you know it's, it's the, the apparatus to tell you the accent falls early. Now, I introduced this last week, and I think I drove some of you absolutely nuts with this. It's a kind of scary terminology, frightening. But once you see how non-frightening it is, you'll say, that's it? Yeah, that's it. So syllables, you remember we started in English with um, those three words, onset, nucleus, coda, to try and give you an imagery of how letters of a word in one syllable appear. Uh, I'm conceptualizing them with words. Here, um, how the Hebrew does it is it's got a breakdown that looks like this. Tonic, pretonic, and pro-pretonic. Now, the first time I saw this, I thought, oh, man, forget about this. I'm toast. You know, just count me out, because it just didn't make sense. And that was many, many years ago, and after much frustration, I, I learned suddenly, you know, if someone would have explained it to me this simply, I think I may, maybe it would have kept some of my hair. So here's how I'm going to explain this to you, and it's, it's really simple. The tonic, or tone, picture it 
as conveying the stressed or accented syllable. So let's go back to our word, our word word. I know you like that. And let's peel this apart again. And I'm going to show you how to label this. So we broke this in half earlier. We said this first part, da, was open and var was closed. We also showed that the, this last part here is kind of the, um, the stress. That's where the syllable falls. Therefore, this part is called tonic. These are all frightening terms, but when you see how simple it is, you say, is that it? That's that, where that heavy stress falls, is essentially what we did in English when we began with onset. It's just in the reverse. That's why I gave you those terms in English. You'll see in a minute. Now, this should be self-evident to you, pre. So we, we see tonic and we see pre. Pre is usually the prefix for what comes before. So pre-tonic is the syllable that comes before the tonic. Wow. It gave fancy words to things. Really frightening at first, and you say, that's it? Yeah, that's it. So if you're able to identify the hard, stressed, accented syllable, which is always at the end in the Hebrew, then you know that the next one over will be pretonic. I'm going to tell you why you need to know this in a minute. There's a reason for this. What happens if this word changes? And there's, I, man, when you get to this, this is my lovely drawing. I could not do this on my computer. My computer just decided it didn't like me anymore and quit. So I did it by hand. It's very beautiful. Uh, so let's take the same word, uh, but plural. So we have now the bar, the barim. It became plural because we added the yod and or the varim. It's plural now. Swap colors. Okay. You're going to love this. I'm going to first find where the most heaviest accent stressed syllable occurs. It occurs right here, right at the end. Reem. I found it immediately. This then is tonic. This next one over, pre tonic, because it comes before the tonic. And the most distant one, the furthest away, think of the planets, the one that's the furthest away, propretonic. And it, again, is self-evident in the name, pro, pre. So we have almost before, before, double, double, before, before. So essentially, we've got a lot of fancy terminology to, to convey an idea that if you'll find the tone, the tonic syllable, which is that end, full syllable, you'll find that the next one over is pretonic, and the next one over is propretonic. You say, why? On earth would I want to learn this, aside from the fact that it's Hebrew grammar? I'll tell you why. Because when we get into doing verbs and nouns, if some of us are still alive, that's meant to kind of lighten the moment here, um, you, will, you will encounter the terminology of pretonic and propretonic reduction and the reason being is just like we have rules of grammar in English, there are rules in uh, Hebrew that sometimes once you begin to conjugate, some vowels will change, some, some appearances will change, and it will be because there will be reduction. So this concept is important, not so much for uh, identifying syllables, so much as down the road you will, it'll become useful for verb parsing and nouns. Now, there's another reason why, and I wrote it down for you, so when you read this, you'll understand as well. 
pronunciation because of lengthening or reduction that may or will occur with nouns and verbs. But also, if you were watching last week, I took you through the lexicon and showed you melek for king, and I showed you what happened when a yod was added and a vowel was added and how it changed the meaning through, through the lexicon. This lesson will help you when you open up the lexicon to understand that most of those three letter uh, words that occur in the lexicon as they appear um, are at their, their base. You'll be able to identify the syllables so that when vowel changes occur, you'll be able to identify words immediately. It won't be like, oh, gee, what, what happened there? You'll, you'll identify them immediately. It takes a little time, but over the course of time, you see the changes and you know what they are. It, that's just exposure to this creates that. I don't think you're going to have to sit and um, memorize this. I think just the exposure to it, eventually, you'll say, I, I get it. Come to this house.